two, one, we're live. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, Earth.org's newest edition of EO Talks, an online conversation with Jonathan Poritz. My name is Dina Robinson, and I will be sort of your MC for this evening. Um, just before we get into the main talk for tonight, I just want to share a little bit about Earth.org and its partner, uh, sister operation, the, the Hive. So Earth.org is a not-for-profit environmental organization based out of Hong Kong. We're working to create visually compelling storylines that will bring people closer to an understanding of what is happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. We want to, um, we want to highlight the human-driven causes of natural disasters worldwide. And this event is also brought to you in partnership with The Hive, co-working spaces, a place where passionate and entrepreneurial people can gather together and share ideas while growing their businesses. The Hive has locations in Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, Australia, Singapore, and Taiwan. So now getting into the main guest for this evening, Jonathan Porritt is a British environmentalist, author, and the former director of Friends of the Earth. He has devoted his personal and professional life to raising awareness of the climate crisis serving as the chair of the Green Party of England and Wales in the 1980s and co-founding Forum for the Future, one of the UK's leading sustainable development charities. These are just a few of his many positions in the environmental world. So the topic of tonight's discussions, along with many others, is Jonathan's new book, Hope in Hell, which will be released on April the 6th. It is this inspiring book, as well as his lifelong devotion to creating a more sustainable future that we will be discussing tonight. Just before I launch into the, the questions, I would just like to remind our audience tonight that there will be a Q&A session after this interview. So um, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat box or leave them in the comments on um, the Facebook pages, and then we will be sure to direct them to Jonathan. So launching right into tonight. Jonathan, how are you doing in these crazy times? Yep, crazy is the right word, that's for sure. Um, here in the UK, I've been in more or less the same house in the same room for more or less a year, really. The only good thing that's going on at the moment, it's springtime, Dina. So the sap is rising, birds are singing, everything's out and about. So there is a sense of renewed energy and even a little bit of hope creeping back into our proceedings, which is good. Wonderful. And it's, and it's with that like optimistic tone that we you know, start with this discussion. Um, for those viewers who may not be fully aware of your history as an environmental activist, could you please summarize uh, your journey to us from the Green Party to your time with Friends of the Earth and Forum of the Future to now? So that's a 45 year journey in what I hope will be no more than a minute, as it were. Um, I was lucky enough to encounter a, a, a book called Blueprint for Survival back in 93, um, published by The Ecologist magazine. I joined the Green Party in 1974. Uh, in 1984, I went to Friends of the Earth as its director, and that was the sort of most remarkable period of, of my life in terms of green activism, really, because it was a very dynamic period of time for environmental ideas in the UK and globally. Um, after the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, I came back to the UK, set up Forum for the Future in 1996, which is my principal organization today. Very different dynamic, emphasizing positive energy rather than the uh, campaigning style of Friends of the Earth and the Green Party. And for the last 25 years, I've worked with a huge variety of different partners around the world including some of the world's largest companies to try and get them to do more and do it faster than they might otherwise be inclined to do. So it's been a, it's been a fascinating time. And I, I know we're going to come on, Dina, and talk about what happens next, but that's the sort of rhythm of it to date, is the first 20 years or so in very um, campaigning-oriented organizations and the second half more in consensus building, positive solutions work particularly with the business sector and in the meantime a little bit of my life nearly 10 years in fact advising government as the chair of the sustainable development commission from 2000 to 2009 okay and and sorry just um just just before I, we I, I ask you about your book you were talking about you know your life has kind of been segmented into these very distinct 
kind of tasks. What do you found has been the most, I, I suppose, frustrating, you know, advocating to the public or engaging with governments? What, well, what would you say is the most frustrating part of your, of your job? <laughs> it's quite a long list, Dina. Um, the, I think the really, the really worrying thing is that we are meant to have what is called evidence-based policymaking all around the world. The idea is that policymakers marshal the science, the evidence available to us. They use that then to come up with better ways of doing whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're talking about economics or social issues or international concerns, et cetera, et cetera. And we use the foundation of good knowledge based on insights into the workings of the natural world and human societies to develop better policies. Well, blow me down. There's a bit of a shocker because I'm sorry to say that in the best part of 45 years, we do not have evidence-based policy making to work with. And the consequence is we're, now we're in terrible catch-up mode. I mean, the science of climate change has been uncontested yeah. from a scientific point of view for the best part of 25 years. It's been hotly contested from a political point of view, but the science has never really been subjected mm. to any quite serious questioning or doubt. It's only those who wanted to delay the onset of that science who succeeded in making such a virulent debate about it in so many parts of the world. It's, it's very um, admirable that you've managed to maintain this, um, your, your motivation for advocating for a, a greener future, Jonathan. So um, getting onto, onto your book. So can you please explain to us what your new book, Hope in Hull, is about? I've given sort of a very brief um, synopsis, but Please, in, in your words, what is it about and what spurred you to write it, especially after, you know, a 45-year career? Yeah, no. It's clear to me that things are moving. There's no question about that. I mean, people are beginning to understand that this is more than just a minor environmental issue. This is a big mm. shock to our expectations of a better world. And I think more and more people now are minded to be part of the solutions to those problems, frankly, not to sit on the sidelines and watch other people try and make sense of it. But it's really tricky for people to understand just how urgent this is. I've, I've been very struck by what is called the tragedy of the horizon, the things that are right in our faces right now, short term, get dealt with by politicians. So the pandemic is a, a classic example. Governments all around the world, well, with a few exceptions in Brazil, for instance, and in the USA under the previous incumbent of the White House. Governments really have responded with an astonishing sort of speed and thrown resources at it. So that's a real time, very powerful concerted response. Longer term issues don't get that kind of political engagement. So anything that looks as if it can be put off to tomorrow will be put off till tomorrow. So the tragedy of the horizon is that things the politicians deem to be appropriate for the long term don't get the attention they deserve and that's the classic situation we're in at the moment where we've neglected so much of the pressing urgency of climate change that we're now all in rather manic catch-up mode so um your your previous work has tended to take a more um reconciliatory approach to face the climate crisis often cooperating with business leaders and politicians to achieve com compromises in Hope in Hell, you say that you have come to the conclusion that more radical action is needed. So uh, what was it that led you to the conclusion? You, you mentioned, you know, we're in desperate catch up mode, but can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I should unpack that a bit because I'm not in Hope in Hell. I'm not advocating that we should stop doing the work we're doing, that we should yeah. stop working with business or we should stop trying to uh, persuade politicians to move faster and further. And none of those things become less relevant. They're all still absolutely crucial, but they're not adequate. That's the problem. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the gap between what the science tells us and what we are actually doing by way of policy responses to that science, the gap is huge. And my conclusion from writing this book and doing a lot of research into the reality of climate change is that those politicians won't move fast enough and far enough unless significant additional pressure 
is brought to bear on them. And this is true all around the world, whatever kind of democracy you're talking about, or even in some of the world's biggest autocracies, countries like China and so on. We have to bring more pressure to bear. And what that means is that the civil disobedience side of it, the more radical campaigning side of it will become much more important over the course of the next few years. The existing campaigning, the work with companies, the work with governments, the work with civil society, none of that will become less important, but we will need to see much clearer radical action to complement all of that that is going on, if you like, in a more conventional way. Sure. Uh, so, so you actually touched on it in, in your answer. So you say that civil disobedience is the best antidote to the current emergency. What are sort of the irreplaceable components to um, an ideal movement of civil disobedience that would allow it to effectively counter the climate crisis? I think we've pretty easily forgotten a lot of what was going on in 2019. I mean, the shock of the pandemic has been so great that mm -hmm. Inevitably, what was happening in 2019 has been overlooked recently, but we should remember that here in the UK and, and many countries around the world, uh, including the United States, there was a much more radical outpouring of concern from different organizations, including in particular young people's organizations. And for me, it's very noticeable that those new organizations at that time had a marked impact on the ways in which politicians responded. So in the UK, for instance, there is no doubt that the combination of Extinction Rebellion, the XR movement, as it's called, plus the strikes for Friday, young climate campaigners mm -hmm. um, going on strike had a huge impact on the UK political scene. We were the first country to commit to a net zero economy by 2050 and to put that in legislation. There's no doubt that that political move was significantly influenced by a much more radical kind of campaigning out on the streets of UK's towns and cities. Now, in the USA, it was a bit different because obviously nothing would have persuaded Donald Trump to do any of the things that are required as a consequence of climate change. But those young climate activists were extremely vocal and, and very effective in their campaigning and had a marked impact on the Democratic Party which helped to shape the Democrats election campaign, helped shape the policy platform of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And they've been, those young climate activists have been extremely active in raising a much more radical voice than was there before. So these things are critical, a critical part of the total picture, if you like. They're not the only thing. Yeah. So there's no way that civil disobedience is going to become the only tactic available to climate campaigners around the world. That isn't going to happen, but it is likely to become a more significant tactic. Mm -hmm. So something else that you say is that there is no more room for people to be passive bystanders uh, and that everyone has an active role to play. Why do you think that climate pessimism is just as bad as climate optimism in encouraging passivity and why is this so risky? I know I touched on you. How have you maintained your motivation for so long? I suppose <laughs> I am part of the problem here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting state of play at the moment because there are more and more people who have come to the conclusion that it may already be too late yeah. to do what we need to do to stop the worst impacts of climate change. And we, we can't avoid continuing really bad impacts of climate change. We've already put enough warming into the atmosphere to yeah. guarantee that we will have uh, continued traumatic impacts on humankind. Uh, for the indefinite future, I'm sorry to say for anyone listening to this, for the whole of the rest of our lives, there's just nothing we can do to avoid that. The real issue is, can we avoid what is called runaway climate change, which is where the impacts become so grave that they trigger these feedback loops in natural systems and they feed off themselves. And then you arrive at these tipping points where the climate systems tip over into a new state and it's then difficult, practically impossible to bring those climate systems back to a more stable condition that they were in before. Now, mm. I don't believe we've arrived at the point where we've got runaway climate change on our hands, irreversible runaway climate change, and the vast majority of scientists don't believe that either. Mm. But there are some who do. 
And there are some activists and academics and authors who believe that it is too late to do anything about it. But the difficulty about that message is that if you're listening to it, you think to yourself, oh, okay, well, it's too late to do anything about it. So what the hell, I might as well not bother doing the things that I could still do in my life to make a difference, working with other people to make an even bigger difference, thinking about this politically, as well as in terms of lifestyle changes, I might as well not bother because mm. these people tell me it's not gonna make any difference anyway, whatever we do. So this is sometimes referred to the phenomenon of doomism, a sort of apocalyptic approach to this, which tells us that we are all going to hell in a handcar and frankly, it doesn't matter a jot, whatever you do in your own life or politically from now on, because it won't make any difference. So for me, those doomists, as they're sometimes referred to, the doom and gloom merchants, as we used to be called back in the 1970s, and 1980s, mind you, it doesn't help if they leave people disempowered rather than empowered to do what needs to be done. Sure. Um, okay, so it's a kind of um, kind of shifting tone. Another sort of big part of your book is you look to kind of, um, in, you know, technological innovations and, and what we can actually do to counter the climate crisis. So you point out the recent advancements in technology and falling costs of renewables as a key reason to be hopeful for the future. But... Uh, you also think that nuclear energy should have no further role to play in our energy mix. In terms of the future of energy, could you, um, you know, elaborate on why you think it is that nuclear energy should be abandoned? Quite a loaded question, I think. Let me just, no, not loaded at all, very direct. Um, but let me just come to first to renewables, because people don't actually understand what's going on. And I, I, I need to take every opportunity I can to remind people that we're in a, the midst of a renewables revolution. The changes going on are utterly extraordinary. And that's because we have seen dramatic reduction in costs of all renewables, but particularly wind power and solar power. We've seen increased efficiency and we've seen an increased contribution now to grid-based systems, electricity systems around the world. So it may surprise some of the uh, listeners to this, um, this session, that in the UK last year, advanced industrial economy, 42% of our electricity came from renewables. 9% came from nuclear. Mm. So here in the UK, our contribution from renewables is already huge, and it will get bigger. By the end of this year, we might be getting 50% of our electricity from renewables. Now, people don't understand that implications of that, because it means we're going to see revolutionary shifts in electricity systems all around the world, not just the rich world, but in the poor world as well, particularly, actually, in the in the poorer world, where they will be able to benefit from the contribution for from renewables off grid and on grid. So obviously, all our electricity in advanced industrial economies comes through a grid system in many poor countries around the world. They are off the grid. But at that point, solar energy can become the absolute game changer for hundreds of millions of poor people all around the world. So this is a revolution. It will make a massive difference to expectations of a low carbon economy for the future. And I just want to say that at first, because you can't disconnect the story about renewables from the story about nuclear. Mm. And the two things need to be considered in the same frame. Um, so I can I can carry I can jump on and just speak to the nuclear thing very quickly, Dina, because for me, it's perfectly clear that that nuclear has made a big contribution to electricity supplies over the last uh, 40, 50 years. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. It is a low carbon source of electricity. It is not a zero carbon source, which I'm sorry to say an awful lot of nuclear advocates describe it as, which is deliberately dishonest, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, it still gives rise to emissions from the mining of the uranium all the way through to the commissioning, the decommissioning of the reactors and the handling of the nuclear waste. It still creates greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a low carbon source. But really and truly, they've not been able to crack the perennial problems associated with nuclear. Massive costs. I mean, nuclear power is so expensive now. Uh, very delayed construction times. Um, it takes an average of 14 years to get a new nuclear reactor up and running from the point where it is given permission to go ahead. And of course, there are huge problems associated still with nuclear waste. We don't yet have reliable mechanisms for dealing with that. 
and concerns about proliferation, about security, even more so cybersecurity these days, which make nuclear a very unattractive um, source of the electricity, low carbon electricity we need. And the great thing is we don't actually need it any longer because renewables plus storage plus efficiency plus reconfigured grid systems will actually do us proud without needing any further nuclear. Sure. But then Jonathan, uh, that actually takes me to my next question. You've outlined the problems with nuclear, you know, the massive costs, the, the, the time. Why do so many um, activists and, you know, politicians, why do they continue to sing nuclear's praises? Why do they continue to advocate for it then? Some of that's just historical. I mean, in all, in all the big uh, nuclear nations, and I mean by that the countries that have relied on nuclear weapons as part of their defense capability, Nuclear power is an essential part of the whole nuclear establishment. So in the USA, in Russia, in China, in France, in the UK, nuclear weapons and nuclear power go hand in hand. They constitute a kind of nuclear establishment that relies, one bit relies on the other bit. So politicians have got used to, to seeing nuclear power as a, a given in the energy mix. For those countries that don't have nuclear weapons, of course, they have, some of them have developed successful nuclear power programs, mm -hmm. but that's very difficult for them to go on doing that any longer just because of these inherent difficulties around cost, construction delays, and so on. Just one thing, Dina, there are, the politicians are still all wedded to nuclear power. All the major parties here in the UK, for instance, are still in favor of nuclear power. You can overdo the number of environmentalists, there aren't that many environmentalists that believe that nuclear power is a necessary part of our journey to a net zero economy. There are some, and some of them have arrived at that position um, very honestly after doing a lot of work on this. They just think that the challenge of getting to a net zero economy by 2050 is so great that we're going to need nuclear as well as all the renewables that we can get. I disagree with that, but I mm -hmm. understand and respect the position they come from. But they're a small part of the total green movement. Okay. Um, something that's, that, that just came through now, which actually ties in perfectly with this. So while all of the UK's existing nuclear power plants will be closed by the end of 2030, a consortium led by Rolls-Royce has announced plans to build up to 16 mini nuclear plants, uh, referred to as small modular reactors. How do you feel about the UK's expansion of nuclear energy, especially since you, you just said, like, we don't need it? Yeah, there's a lot of interest in this new um, nuclear opportunity called small modular reactors, mm -hmm. um, as well as advanced nuclear reactors. Um, there's a lot of excitement about all of this. And you're right, a lot of businesses have got together to come forward with some plans for building small modular reactors. Mm. Let's be absolutely clear, Dina, there's no design for a small modular reactor anywhere in actually there is a one design that has been given preliminary approval in the usa and that will now go forward as an idea to be investigated further there's no design that's been approved here in the uk there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to build these reactors at the relatively small cost that they claim i mean every single new nuclear technology has been sold in with a degree of dishonesty that is unbelievable. It always ends up costing far, far more than they say it will be. Yeah. And when you use the word small, you have to be a little bit careful. These small modular reactors, each one will be as big as the first generation of nuclear reactors we had here in the UK, which were called Magnox reactors at 440 megawatts. They're pretty big yeah. nuclear facilities. They're not small at all. And people tend to think, oh, they're like those nuclear reactors that we use on our nuclear submarines. They're not like that. <laughs> they are great big bits of kit. And the truth of it is, we don't know whether they can be delivered at scale or at cost or whether they can actually make a difference or not. So in my opinion, um, the government wants to give money to this consortium and bring forward uh, improved ideas and a design for a, for a SMR. Good. OK, let's see what it looks like. My bet is we're not going to see anything emerging from that spasm of excitement <laughs> for at least a decade, if at all, frankly. Okay. 
Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so you discuss how technical fixes, innovations and growing social will are major reasons to hope for a better future. But to what extent do you think that political statistic, staticity, sorry, fossil fuel incumbencies and conventional business systems can hinder the implementation and realization of these sources of hope? There's no doubt we've still got a bit of a battle on our hands. I mean, things are much better than they used to be. The, the, what were called the climate denialists have pretty much gone away. I mean, there came a point where they could no longer deny the science. They've done a very good job denying the science for the best part of 30 years to the confusion of everybody around the world. But eventually science speaks. Eventually you can't ignore what is actually happening <coughs> in our lives. Those denialists, they've turned themselves into what are now described as inactivists. Mm -hmm. So their entire game plan now is to delay, to confuse, to obscure, to stand in the way of policymakers who want to bring forward really purposeful, accelerated solutions to climate change. There's a fascinating new book out by one of the world's most eminent uh, climate scientists, a man called Michael Mann, uh, mm -hmm. who's been right at the heart of the climate debate for the last 30 years. And his new book is, in, is titled The New Climate War, because what he's saying is that all of these incumbencies, the fossil fuel interests, they haven't gone away. They've just moved into a rather different position. So they're not denying now, they're seeking to delay. That's why he calls them the inactivists. Mm -hmm. it, it's a great book. And we can see that all over the world. These are very powerful interests still. They're often backed by very powerful billionaires, by very rich individuals who've got richer off the success of the fossil fuel industries. That's in most countries around the world. So this isn't going to be a walkover. This is still a real battle. But the great thing is that most businesses now are very pragmatic about this. They accept the science of climate change. They don't want to get caught up in some incredible tussle watching the remains of the fossil fuel industry uh, drag out its existence for as long as possible. They want real solutions to real time problems now to enable them to go on creating wealth in their markets in the way that they want to. So yes, we're gonna to have to fight this one through for a long time to come, but I'm convinced now that most people can see the continued role for these incumbent interests as being very problematic. In fact, inimical to the prospects for humankind um, in the long term. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, and um, on, on that note, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, thank you for, for listening. We're actually going to move on to some audience questions now. We, we do have a few here. Let me just get them up here. So, uh, Jonathan, how has COVID, or in your opinion, how has COVID shifted the dialogue about around the climate crisis? So how is it, you know, sort of changed the way we approach the yeah. problem? This is such a big thing. And, and I think everybody's, I, I'm trying to make sense of this now and trying to get a perspective on the implications of COVID for the way in which we address the uh, pandemic. It's difficult to do that since we're still in the midst of the pandemic. The lives of millions of people are still are very seriously affected by the pandemic. So one has to be a little bit careful about this. But I do see the COVID-19 as a kind of warning shot across our bows. There's no question about that. It's a global phenomenon, which affects every single human being on planet Earth. Mm. It's caused in part by our lack of care for the natural world. I think we will come to see that this particular virus has come about through continuing disruption of the Earth's ecosystems. We know that the impact of this will play out for a very long time. The yeah. International Monetary Fund is talking of a total cost of somewhere between 40 and 50 trillion dollars. It's a sum of money which is almost too big to contemplate. Yeah. So from the point of view of what we can take away from that traumatic shock, we have to hope that the following will happen, that we will accept that we're not as secure and impregnable as a species as we thought we were, that mm -hmm. we are much more vulnerable, that the natural world still has lots of surprises up its sleeve for us. Don't forget epidemiologists and virologists are already talking about the next 
pandemic, not just this one. We've learned some very harsh lessons about overconfidence in terms of our role in the natural world. So I'm hoping that we can take away a lot of learning from this and that we will replace some of the hubris about our existing model of economic development with a proper sense of humility, the need to co-establish a better relationship with the natural world, if you like, to co-create the wealth that we need without destroying the natural wealth of the planet itself, and to work out different ways of creating the prosperity that humankind will understandably go on demanding in the future. In that respect, COVID-19 could be, could be a real benefit, a gift mm. to us, just so long as we learn some, or we bank some of the really important learning that is already becoming apparent to us. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we keep hearing that COVID is, you know, going to be this great reset and it will spur people <laughs> to think about the, about the future. But, you know, you hear all these stories that emissions are rebounding back to pre-pandemic levels and you know you, you just it, it's very frustrating but mm -hmm. moving on to something a little bit more hopeful um what do you say to people who denigrate young environmental campaigners like Greta Thunberg saying she should you know keep quiet and leave the decision making to the grown-ups I don't have much time for those <laughs> people to be honest <laughs> In fact, one of the more, more inspirational things that I've been part of over the last two years is working with a lot of these young climate activists mm. and having a chance to experience in 2019 all the upside as they got themselves organized and mobilized. And it was a fantastic new voice, a new energy in our perhaps somewhat tired climate campaigning. And then all the difficulties of 2020 as it was impossible to maintain that momentum impossible to get young people out on the streets as one of them rather plaintively said to me we can't exactly go on strike given that we're not actually in school so a lot of that momentum got lost yes yeah and for me we will see in 20 second half of 2021 leading up to this big conference in uh, glasgow at the end of the year the conference of the parties at the end of the year i think we'll see a resurgence in young people's activism for, uh, listen, for the old, for, let me be blunt about it, for, for people who've got used to ruling the roost in this area and have never actually listened to the voice of young people, you just have to accept that you're a completely sad and irrelevant part of a system that's dying in front of our eyes. We need these voices. We need this energy. If you listen to Greta Thunberg carefully, the way in which she speaks her truth to power is incredibly inspiring to me mm. and i'm very much hoping that we can see all around the world and i'm thinking again particularly here of the usa where you've got fantastic young people's organizations um there the sunrise movement climate mobilization a host of different organizations that have been extremely influential already i'm hoping that they will come bouncing back in a big way in the second half of this year in fact there's a theory that in the USA, if it hadn't been for a lot of those young climate organizations, we wouldn't have the, the opportunity we've got now to bring forward really radical climate actions in the USA, mm. which wouldn't happen if the Biden-Harris administration wasn't able to get things through the Senate. They're only able to get things through the Senate because two Senate seats in Georgia were won in January, giving them a balance of, well, the balance of power, because the yeah. vice president can vote at the end of the day on a tied vote. And those two seats in Georgia, two Senate seats were very close and young people's organizations were absolutely involved in those fights, in those senatorial fights all the way through and were fantastic and persuaded huge numbers of young people to get themselves registered, to turn out, to campaign. Without that, those two seats might have gone to the Republicans, in which yeah. case the Senate would be what it usually is, is a bastion of 
um, backward looking uh, negative republicanism. Um, and we wouldn't have had the chance to see the Biden Harris action plan on climate change move forward, which is a really exciting action plan, by the way, it's fantastic stuff going on in the USA right now. Mm. Okay, um, so I, I'm going to get to a related question and then I am going to ask you about the, the USA, Jonathan. So Katrina asks, what would the number one thing that Jonathan uh, would suggest for young people to do to combat climate change, especially during the pandemic? I'm always struck by the fact that Greta Thunberg herself, whenever she's asked that question, she says, look, it's not for me to tell you what to do. My job is to tell you what's happening in the world today. Mm. And your responsibility is to get your heads around that, whatever age you are, whether you're 13 years old or 83 years old, doesn't really matter. You have to understand what's happening in the world today. And then you have to think about what your own responsibilities are in addressing that reality. And many young people work like that now. They, they know about climate change far more than preceding generations did. They really do think about the science, they think about the impacts, they can see for themselves around the world what happens when you get these appalling climate induced uh, disasters and the impact on people and on the natural world. There are still an awful lot of people, for instance, traumatized by what happened with the horrendous wildfires in Australia at the start of 2020. You know, this was just uh, uh, incredible to behold. And for young people, they look at that, the death of probably around 2 billion wild animals of one kind or another, it's a staggering thing. So they're already much more on this than, than previous generations have been. In terms of the actions they can take, young people are pretty smart about this as well. They need to work with their parents and their teachers yeah. to start getting bigger changes at home and in school, because that's where you can make a real difference. And if you look at the things that young people are doing, for instance, changing their diets, eating less meat, thinking much more about plant-based substitutes, thinking about cutting out some of the more destructive um, dietary patterns, all of that stuff. It's, it's an inspiration to older generations already. So for me, young people find their way through to their own appropriate climate response. And I'm a bit nervous about trying to tell them what they should be doing because they're <laughs> pretty damn good. In fact, much better at their age than I, than I was at their age, I can tell you. Fantastic. I love that. Um, so, so Sarah um, says, I worry about how easily climate change is still dismissed by some in the, in the public slash right wing media as left wing tree hugging nonsense. I wonder if there's a way to help climate change be accepted as fact among these groups. I'm sure this is something you've been struggling with for what, 45 years, Jonathan. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a problem, Sarah. It is a problem. And Actually, it doesn't help anybody that climate change has been politicized in that way, that it is predominantly seen as something that progressives on the left are more concerned about than conservatives on the right. Yeah. Now, here in the UK, we don't suffer from that as badly as they do in the USA. And don't forget that our Climate Change Act which is now more than 10 years old, was a complete world beater. That was a cross-party consensus-based piece of legislation where conservatives worked with Labour, worked with the Lib Dems to bring forward a pretty progressive legislative intervention at a time when most countries weren't doing that. So we know that the cross-party stuff can work. Yeah. Um, there's no reason why sensible people on the right would seek to prove their political credentials by dismissing climate change. That's never made any sense to me. How, how does this work that you show what a good politicians you are by turning your back on science and thinking there's a way forward for the people you want to represent that, does, that isn't based on the science? So it doesn't really help. Mm. In the USA, it is still, it's still really problematic. Uh, I mean, to be on the right in the USA strongly correlates with being in denial about the impacts of climate change and refusing to see it as the burning platform, the, the really present danger that it is to humankind. And that's problematic because it means that every single discussion about climate change is politicized between the right and left. And we can't do that. And to be fair to the Biden-Harris administration, the, the measures they're now bringing forward, they're really trying to avoid this 
right left split, Democrats, yeah. Republicans split, climate denial, climate affirming kind of stuff. They're saying, look, this is happening all around the world. We have got the resources to address this in our own country. And if we do it right, we will generate huge prosperity yeah. for US citizens. We will be able to build new sources of, of wealth and uh, innovation. We will be able to provide jobs for millions of young people, but throughout the workforce in those new economies in renewable energy, for instance, in efficiency, retrofitting the housing and the built environment in the USA. We'll be able to think very creatively about what we need to do to restore vitality to our degraded environments, to our forests, to our farms, our topsoil and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a very clear pitch that they're making, which is not politicizing climate change, but basically saying, as we move towards a form of low carbon prosperity, we will create better options for US citizens across the entire political spectrum. Mm. And for me, I think that's pretty canny right now because Joe Biden's got a job on his hand. He has to heal the divides of the last four years. US is a nation divided and the world isn't helped by having the US as a nation divided. So doing it this way with the emphasis on actions that simultaneously meet people's social and economic expectations mm -hmm. is a really smart move. Yeah. Is a really smart move. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that actually goes quite nicely in, into the next question we got, which was during Trump's, um, during Trump's time in the White House, he rolled back something like over a hundred in environmental regulations. So obviously, you know, looking forward, what do you think Biden's administration specifically needs to do to kind of roll these back uh, or sorry, reverse what Trump did. So I know you were talking about how the plan can help, but what is it that they actually have to do in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, it's the legacy that they've inherited is, yeah. is shocking. Um, you know, pretty, pretty much from the start of his administration, Trump was intent on stripping back the Environmental Protection Agency of its uh, regulatory powers, slashing its budget, um, setting, setting back all sorts of re environmental regulations. I, I think it's actually even more than the hundred that was okay. referred to then. So Biden has learned that message and right from the start of his administration from day one, he basically started to unroll all of those things that Trump had done as fast as he possibly can. They've appointed some extremely good regulators, civil servants, if you like, really professional civil servants at the top of the Environmental Protection Agency. They've made it clear that they are going to be science-based in everything that they do. And again, what they're saying is these regulations are good for US citizens. So nobody benefits if you roll back air quality regulations. The only thing that happens is more people die of air pollution. Mm -hmm. Nobody benefits if you roll back regulations on water quality, all that happens is that Americans suffer from an even worse fresh water system, drinking water system, than most citizens in most of the rest of the developed world. And America's water crisis is massive. So every time he steps up and he says, okay, now we're gonna to have to put this right because the last four years got it badly wrong. The emphasis is always on improved living conditions, quality of life, and health yeah. for US citizens. So he's not making an environmental crusade out of it. What he's doing is saying the well-being and the quality of life of every single American citizen depends on us having a healthy environment. Yeah. And that's one of the ways in which we can speak to the aspirations and the needs of people in the US today to get this stuff sorted. And he's moving fast. I mean, I'm impressed. We're not quite at the first hundred days yet, but I am genuinely impressed at the speed with which he's moving because I think all presidents recognize that if you don't get going quickly in the US system, <laughs> you're up for re-election in a remarkably short period of time. And if you haven't banked stuff early on, then you might well not get another chance of doing it later. Mm. Uh, so I think this is actually our last question unless something comes through now. Um, how can we tackle climate misinformation in your opinion? And, and what roles do social, sorry, what role does social media have in this task? 
it is getting better, this issue. I mean, it's, it, it's remarkable how difficult it was to provide the right level of reliable information when the sort of the climate wars, if you like, the battles were going on. And it's worth remembering that even three years ago, maybe four now, the BBC, that kind of bastion of uh, dispassionate, impartial journalism, the BBC still felt obliged somehow to represent balance between these different views. So every time they had a really good authoritative climate scientists on presenting the latest data, whatever it might be, the BBC somehow felt that its charter required it to provide some balance to that scientist. And often they would wheel on these uh, ideologues, these politicians who had a scientific bone in their body, who would then say, no, 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 that's not right. No, that's not what's happening out there in the natural world. And the BBC would think its job was done by providing balance to the listener. Of course, all they were doing was leaving the listeners completely confused about this because the science seemed to be saying one thing. And these people who were in a very contrarian way denying the science, we're just muddling the waters. Now we don't have that any longer, thank God. The BBC woke up, it started yeah. to do its job properly as a public service <laughs> broadcaster, disgraceful record, to be honest, for more than 10 years. Sorry, I love the BBC dearly. They come very high up in my list of things that one couldn't do without in the world, but their record on climate change until the last three or four years was disgraceful. Yeah. Now the consequence of that is that the whole broadcast scene and the mainstream media scene is now less given to this kind of misinformation. But everywhere in the world, you've still got very powerful vested media interests. I can't help but mention Rupert Murdoch mm -hmm. here and yeah. his utterly malign media empire in both the USA and in Australia in particular. They still consistently peddle day after day outright lies and deceptions that keep people confused and misinformed. And it's a shocking thing, actually, that they're allowed to do this. It's utterly shocking. It is getting better, but we've still got a massive amount to do. And all of that, of course, as the questioner suggested, is amplified by social media, where all of these things can get picked up and suddenly um, get amplified in ways that leave people feeling even more confused and divided than they were before. So it's a it's an ongoing struggle, as you can tell, Dina. I'm taking a weary sigh here because 45 years old, I can't believe <laughs> You'll have to do all this stuff, but we do. Yeah. That's the truth. Of it. That you do, yeah. Uh, so last question. Would you ever consider going back into political office and what would be your motivation if so? <laughs> um, well, I, as a member of the Green Party back in the 1970s and early 1980s, I stood uh, seven seven times as a candidate for the Green Party, mostly in local elections, but in two general elections and in one European election. Um, and I never got much of a vote, I have to tell you. I think the highest vote I ever got was 4.5% of votes cast. And I was, I was pretty upbeat about that because that seemed like a lot of votes in those days. I never got close to being elected in our mm. crazy electoral first past the post system here in the UK. And when I went to Friends of the Earth in 1984, I had to say, I am not involved in party politics anymore because mm -hmm. Friends of the Earth is strictly non-party political. Yeah. I'm still a member of the Green Party. Theoretically, I could choose to go back into party politics, stand as a candidate at the next election, do those kind of things. But to a certain extent, my life has moved on since then. I'm never going to be a member of any other political party, that's for sure. But I want to bring my kind of political activism now to bear on the scene in a way that won't necessarily be helped by me just being a representative of the Green Party. I want to speak to progressives across the entire political spectrum, people in the Labour Party, in the Nationalist Parties, in the Lib Dems, who care about these things as passionately as people in the Green Party. I don't, I don't want to be constricted, if you like, in terms of too narrow a partisan base. So I know we're going to need more radical politics. I know the Green Party is the most effective radical voice in a party political system. There's no question about that. But for me, I think I can be most useful here by speaking across the spectrum of progressive mm. radical politics rather than through one particular lens.
Oh, Jonathan, thank you for your candidness. I'd vote for you anyway. Thank you, Roger, who <laughs> sent in that question. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. <laughs> okay, so so that brings us to the to the end of of this this evening. Um, Jonathan, be, before we leave, could you just tell us? Um, your book, Hope in Hell, what is kind of, I suppose, the overarching message that you want to get through with this book? The most important thing is just to be able to share with people the reality, the truth of what is happening in the natural world. So the, I've done a full update on the science of climate change. Yeah. Um, to invite people to look at that honestly, They're, they'll come away from looking at it pretty downcast because it's not good news but then the book is all about saying okay so this is not good news but we know what to do about this we've got ways of dealing with this not just technology but all sorts of different ways of shaping our economies differently organizing ourselves differently in society thinking about education differently the solutions agenda is is absolutely amazing so the whole thrust behind hope in hell was to say yep this is not a good scene, but we have got a fantastic opportunity now to put those things right. And we've still got time to do it. That's the most critical takeaway. We've still got time to do it. So I hope that that gives people a realistic appreciation of what's happening in the world and then a encouragement to get in, get stuck in for themselves and mm. see what they can do. Mm. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, we, we read the book and we thought it was fantastic. So um, everybody, the book is being released on the 6th of April. Um, oh, goodness. Sorry, we actually do have one more question from Ben. Uh, do we have time? Jonathan, would you be willing to answer one more question? Uh, sure. Okay. Climate change is mainly based on the results of utilizing fossil fuels and all over increases in carbon emissions over time. Other problems we are currently also increasingly facing include water scarcity and poison usage. How can we marry these environmental disastrous impacts? It's a good and challenging question, I can assure you, Dina, because what Ben is telling us is that we're not dealing with climate change in isolation. Yeah. We are dealing with climate change on top of a lot of other big issues, particularly impacts on biodiversity, a million species now at risk of extinction in the world today, mm. impacts caused by modern farming, pollution, erosion of soil, loss of forests, buildup of toxics in the environment, plastics in the oceans. I mean, this is a big, big, a big portfolio of environmental problems that we face. So the great thing is to see the solutions to those challenges, to those problems, working in harmony with each other. So very simple example here one of the solutions one of the most important solutions for climate change is to rebuild the health of our natural systems our forests our soils our wetlands our peat bogs our marine environment reefs etc etc because every single time you do what we need to do to rebuild those natural systems we're simultaneously helping to reduce the impact of climate change mm. so it's what some smart policy makers call policy synergy. Every time you come up with a policy, work out what it'll do for some of the other problems that we face. Mm. And then we'll be getting a sort of mutually reinforcing set of uh, wins, if you like, for the environment, for the climate, for people, for biodiversity, and so on. Mm. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you so much, everybody, for your participation tonight. Um, it's been a really interesting chat, Jonathan. We're so grateful you could come on here and, and chat with us. And, and good luck for your book. Um, we, we wish you the thank very you. best. Um, and yes, we'll be watching your work closely. Everybody, please, uh, just as kind of a, a final call, please feel free to, to check out Jonathan's book, as well as earth.org. Um, so we are working really hard to, like I said in the beginning, create visually compelling storylines that basically try to bring us closer to what is actually happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. So thank you so much, everybody, and please stay safe. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks.